Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about the future of trash. The future of trash? In its future, does it just get, like, smellier? Not necessarily. Scientists are coming up with solutions that might surprise you. We'll find out how a worm could help reinvent recycling and what kids can do to make less trash for everyone. I can't wait to find out how, just after this. Trash is one of the biggest problems on our planet. And today, we'll get to meet two scientists who are working to tackle it in two very different ways. But before we get to the solutions, we have to talk about the size of the problem. Yeah, I mean, exactly how much trash do we have on this planet? Um, a lot. Here's one way to think about how much trash we make from one of our scientists. Lily Pollins is a social scientist who studies how we deal with trash. There's kind of this number that gets thrown around that in the United States, every single person makes four pounds of trash every day. Well, so do I like personally generate four pounds of trash every day? Every single person in the United States doesn't actually make four pounds of trash every day. But what that means is the amount of trash that we make in the whole country every day divided by the population works out to be four pounds per person per day. Okay, so that's like a lot of trash, and that's just the new trash. That doesn't count all the trash that my grandparents generated. Yeah, it's kind of mind-boggling to think about. It's just so vast that, like, your brain actually can't quite comprehend that amount. It's so, so much. Yeah, where does it go? So here in the U.S., we basically have three options. The first is a landfill. We put it in a landfill which means we collect the trash and we bury it in the ground under dirt where it gets kind of sealed in and lasts almost forever. The second option is to burn the trash. Then everything you burn turns into ash and that ash goes into a landfill. Okay, so it's just still in a landfill, but it's just smaller. Yeah, and burning it also releases toxic gases, which is not great. So you can bury it or you can burn it. Or you can recycle it. Materials like glass, paper, and certain plastics can be recycled. If the material that that thing is made of could be made into something else, then we call that recycling. All right, so there's three main options for what to do with your trash. And which one's the best? Let's ask our listeners, which option do you like best? Can you think of any other things that you can do with your garbage? Think about it, because we'll come back soon with our second scientist, who's working to improve one of those options with the help of mealworms. Kevin Solomon is a chemical and biomolecular engineer who hopes mealworms are part of the future of plastic recycling. It is kind of interesting, the power of the mealworm, and I think the power of biology. Mealworms, so like those little like segmented creatures you get at the pet shop to feed your lizard or your frog or your pet bug eater. <laughs> your pet bug eater? Yeah. <laughs> so cuddly. We love it. <laughs> yes, you may know them best as food for pets, but inside their tiny stomachs, they may hold the key to solving one of our most persistent garbage problems. A little known secret is that a lot of the things that we send for recycling aren't actually recycled. What? Yeah, unfortunately, it's true for reasons we'll get to later. But Kevin's not specifically a recycling guru. He uses biology or living things to take on the world's biggest challenges. As engineers, we're really problem solvers. And so we look at emerging crises and and think about how to creatively solve them. And so plastics has been an issue for years. I'd say using mealworms is definitely a creative solution to a crisis. Like, we're stuck in this room. The bomb's about to go off. How can we get out of this one? Mealworms. (laughs) I have so many questions, seriously. So, like, how does this work? Well, let's start at the beginning. Kevin's work is inspired by what we could think of as 
nature's recycling, like how animals eat food and turn it into energy. In other words, he studies my favorite subject, which is... Oh, come on. (laughs) Say it. Well, of course, it's poop. (laughs) My lab has expertise in studying the poops of animals and how they have to break things down. It's always about poop, isn't it? (laughs) It is, and it's the best. (laughs) But this isn't about the poop itself. It's the bacteria in the animal's guts that help break things down. What we've recognized is that biology is very good at breaking down these contaminated plastic waste materials. Okay, so mealworms can chomp away on plastic. But how is that better than our current recycling system? Traditional recycling uses high heat to break down plastic's chemical bonds. But this only works well for clean plastic. Your leftover food becomes part of the plastic if it's heated up. And that ruins the recycling process. So ultimately, even though you put it in the recycling bin, at some point, a decision's made and it goes to the landfill. Oh man, well that's not useful at all. I know. But Kevin thinks that this is a solvable problem. Because where chemistry fails, biology or life could succeed. These biological systems don't care about those impurities. It can work in spite of the fact that there's pizza sauce and other things on it. It would mean that these things would actually get recycled and that there would be less plastic in landfills. So actually recycling things sounds really great. And the small but mighty mealworm turns out to love a plastic buffet, eating the sauce from your leftovers and the plastic container it came in. So you're saying they're not very picky. Now, you might ask the question, why do they even degrade plastic at all? Yeah, I would definitely ask that question. (laughs) (laughs) Well, mealworms are used to eating leaves that have a waxy coating on them. And so those waxy compounds on leaves that help make them waterproof, those look very similar to the chemicals in plastics. And so as far as the mealworm and the microbes in their gut are concerned, they're eating a leaf. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, mealworms really aren't that bright. You can fool them pretty easily. (laughs) They're literal bug babies, and they don't know better. So Kevin started working with another scientist named Mark Blenner. Mark studies how to take what the mealworms break down and make it into new plastics. There is evidence that the types of things that these plastics break down into are some of the same building blocks that Mark uses to make new types of compounds. And so that was a nice intersection for us. So they decided to run an experiment together. They put a bunch of mealworms into a container full of yummy plastics. They wanted to find the mealworms that love to chow down on this plasticky buffet. So just like you might like pizza or broccoli or other things, we give the, the, the mealworms and their, their microbes a buffet of different plastics, and we see what are the things that they like to eat. Mealworms have all different types of microbes in their gut to digest their food, just like we do. Kevin and Mark were trying to identify which microbes were the ones really doing the work of digesting the plastic. Oh, I get it. So, like, some of the mealworm microbes are like, yum, plastics! And some are like, oh, no, there's nothing here I can eat. (laughs) Exactly. Those picky microbes kind of die off, and it makes it really easy to find the plastic-loving microbes that are surviving and thriving. So, essentially, the ones that like plastics will multiply or divide more quickly. Well, survival of the fittest. So is the plan to breed plastic-loving mealworms, and then we all get to throw them in our plastic recycling to eat it up? (laughs) Nope. Actually, Kevin's vision is to remove the worms themselves from the whole process. Oh, that's great news, because, like, the worms are disgusting. (laughs) They're no fun to handle. Yeah, I don't want to see those in our home. (laughs) (laughs) Kevin's idea is much cleaner. He wants to have mealworm microbe recycling plants with the microbes breaking down the plastic in big vats of liquid. The things that these microbes make to degrade these things in isolation. And so these processes are simple as opposed to worms where you probably have to feed them, add water, and then when they die, you have to pull them out. We don't have to worry about those kind of things. So as the microbes chomp away, so to speak, 
they would be breaking down the plastic into chemical compounds, which look a lot like the chemical compounds that make up oil. Oil? Like the stuff we get from the ground? Yeah, plastics are actually made from oil. So making something similar from biology would cut down on our fossil fuel use. Oh, so it's tackling both plastics and climate change. That's incredible. Yeah, so once Kevin and Mark find that perfect plastic-eating microbe, they'll hack its systems to have it go plastic in and oil out. In my lab and in Mark's lab, we also have technologies that allow us to engineer microbes so we can tell them, rather than making more of yourself, you should make a medicine or you should make a biofuel. Whoa, so they're essentially able to reprogram the microbe like a computer to say what it should make. Yeah, or like a little mini factory. And they'll be telling the microbes to make the building blocks of new plastics. So we'll never have to make brand new plastics and actually recycle our stuff into useful products again. That's amazing. So can it actually happen? Yes, in concept. Mark and Kevin have a ways to go on their mealworm microbes, but other types of plastic are further along in the system. So the science is at least established for certain types of plastics. Kevin told me that scientists understand how to recycle the type of plastic used for water bottles and food containers in this way. But plastic bags or styrofoam or other kinds of plastic need different microbes to do the job. These things are all chemically different and they all require slightly different solutions. Well, that's really encouraging. It's like we don't have to just keep living with a recycling system that doesn't really work. Science can find solutions. Yeah, especially when scientists work hand-in-hand with nature or biology. You will be quite surprised at the chemistry and the power that biology has. It just needs to be harnessed in the right way to solve the problems that we actually have currently have. Yeah, I'll say that's really surprising. Um, (laughs) But it's also so cool to think that we can solve problems with things like mealworm gut microbes. (laughs) Like, who would have thought? It will take some time to upgrade our current recycling system to a microbe-based one, but I'm optimistic. Kevin says once we have this better solution to recycle the plastic that we have, we can think about cleaning up what's out there in the environment. So there's still kind of a lot of work to do. Yes, but next, Lily Pollins will tell us what we can do now to tackle our own trash problems. Okay, so we heard from Lily back in the beginning of the show. Telling us that we each make four pounds of trash per day. Right. And she says that the best thing we can do to cut down on how much trash we make is for cities and towns to just make less trash. So in my research, I go around and I look at specific cities and I look at what they've done over time and I see if it has helped them make less trash and how. So what helps cities make less trash? Well, one of the biggest things is to stop throwing leftover food into the regular trash bins and start composting it. Food waste has a lot of nutrients that we could put into the soil and help new plants and new food grow. But instead, we bury it in the landfill, and then those nutrients kind of get sucked away from our soil. Yeah, we've been composting for a couple of years, first in our backyard, and then we had city composting programs. Yeah, and some cities do have composting programs, but definitely not all of them. And Lily says if your city doesn't, kids can make a difference here. Kids actually are really great advocates. And sometimes I think like kids kind of underestimate their power in this way. Lily has a few ideas that kids can advocate or ask for their cities to add compost to their waste management programs. You could ask your classmates to all write a letter to the mayor of the city and explain why the city needs better waste management. A letter writing campaign. Does that really work? Mayors love to get letters from kids about things that they care about. That's because kids' letters are cute and adult letters, they're not. (laughs) Honestly, cuteness is power. Lily says kids' letters do make an impact. But if you want to go further, do it yourself. Start with your school. How's it dealing with waste? Can you help it do better? 
So schools can actually do things like compost themselves, you know, set up composting programs where kids can learn about this sort of science of how food goes from being, you know, like a melon rind to dirt. (laughs) That's so cool. That's cool and educational. Plus, it helps your school make less trash, and you can put that in your letter to the mayor. I think of that as like a demonstration project where you actually show the city what's possible. So instead of just being like, you should do this, you can say, we did this, and you can too. Exactly. And Lily says kids have what it takes to make it happen. Kids are so good at that because like you're good organizers and you have good ideas and you can make things happen. And then adults like... They have to listen. Yeah, we really do have to listen to kids because if we don't, there are problems. <laughs> yes, especially when they have legitimately good ideas for solving big problems facing our planet. Or, you know, when they ask for something like candy at a checkout line. We may not do it, but uh, we take the request into consideration. Now all we need to do is just take that energy and scale it up to the whole planet. Yeah, so <laughs> be persistent and want it so bad. <laughs> Do you want to help your city make less trash? First, do your research. With the help of an adult, see what options your city or town has available. I did this, and I was actually surprised that we had more options than I thought. You can figure out if you can use these trash and recycling programs more, or if you think your city needs your help, try taking Lily's advice. a lot of help from a lot of people with this episode. Thanks to Dr. Lily Pollins, Assistant Professor of Urban Policy and Planning at Hunter College. She's also the author of Resisting Garbage, a great book for grown-ups who are interested in trash. Also thanks to Dr. Kevin Solomon and Dr. Mark Blenner, both Assistant Professors of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Delaware. You can hear the story of how one city learned to make less trash in our special bonus interview episode with Lily Pollins. To listen, pledge to support us on Patreon for just $1 a month or more at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. We'll have free resources to learn more about how to make less trash and new solutions for recycling on the blog on our website at sciencepodcastforkids.com. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our editor and made the episode art. Eric Kuhn is our engineer and mixer. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and did all the sound design on this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery. Science Discovery.